So we have a conference here about entanglement, and so I thought, why not give a talk just about what entanglement is? And doing that will, of course, also address the question of what is quantum mechanics anyway. Um, so let me ask first, how many of you know quantum mechanics? About half, so that's good. Um, and how many of you are pretty familiar with entanglement? So a little more than half, so that's good too. So great, let's have the first slide. Uh, we'll just first talk about some of the classic views of what entanglement is, and this is probably the one that most people hear of first. They know that entanglement is something that Einstein really didn't like, and he referred to it famously as spooky action at a distance. And 30 years after Schrodinger introduced the idea of entanglement, Einstein still didn't like it on the day he died and believed that quantum mechanics was wrong because it included entanglement, which was this nasty non-local idea. And I think the dominant view of entanglement uh, in the world, in both physics and in popular culture, has something to do with non-locality. Uh, now there's, of course, another idea of entanglement, next please, which is that it's just this sort of wonderful idea. Uh, and it's very sort of sunny and lovely and, and cool. And lots of people also have this idea about entanglement. And actually, this is why physicists take acid, to try to understand entanglement. I'm not kidding. Uh, but unfortunately, this kind of lovely view of entanglement doesn't tell us anything detailed about it. So it, it doesn't help us actually understand it. Now, if you're a physics student, what you get is the following idea. Next, please. Uh, now, Niels Bohr didn't actually say, shut up and calculate. Those words were put in his mouth by David Merman uh, back in the 70s. But that kind of summarizes the Copenhagen view of quantum mechanics, that there's a classical world out there, and that's the world we all inhabit. And then there's the quantum world, which is totally different, and it's all entangled. There's lots of entangled stuff going on down there. But up here in the classical world, everything is fine and local, and we can talk about, you know, our instruments, for example, and not get confused. So what physics students end up being faced with is this stuff. Um, they're told, don't think about it, just learn the math and learn to turn the crank. And so they look at these equations, and this is the Schrodinger equation, and it looks like a perfectly reasonable equation of motion, right? It just says the time rate of change of this thing, which is a state vector, equals something. And if you look at the equation, then, you know, you've got an operator acting on the state vector, and that looks perfectly reasonable, but there's a problem. And the problem is that. That's the square root of minus one. That's an imaginary number. And so as a physics student, you see the Schrodinger equation, you say, what's this imaginary number doing here? This equation's supposed to tell me how real stuff changes in time, and I've got this imaginary number that doesn't make any sense. Okay? But maybe there's a deep insight here. If you read this equation literally, it says the time rate of change is imaginary. Now, Heraclitus was trying to tell us that in 500 BC. So maybe that's important. So stick that someplace in memory. And let's go to the next slide. This is the picture I saw when I was still in high school and got a preprint of uh, John Wheeler's paper, uh, Is Physics Legislated by Cosmogony? And first saw this image of the U with the I. And I thought, that's really, really cosmic. But of course, this doesn't give us any detail either about what entanglement really is. It's a nice idea, it's sort of a cool icon, but it doesn't tell us anything. So what we're gonna talk about is what is entanglement? Let's have the next slide. And my goal for today is to understand where it comes from and what it means. Next, and in particular, 
I'm going to try to convince you that it comes from one simple equation, and I do mean simple. This is an equation you all learned in elementary school. It's not the Schrodinger equation. And it leads to a very simple consequence. And so I want to try to give you an idea that quantum theory is simple. It's really, really simple, much more simple than classical mechanics. But classical mechanics is where we have to start. So next. Here's classical physics. And uh, you know, all know the story of Newton and the apple. What Newton introduced to the world was a really radical idea. Newton's radical idea was, if you want to predict the future, you don't have to look at chicken guts or crystal balls or anything like that. You write down an equation. And the equation describes doing something to the world. And the equation lets you turn the crank mathematically and predict what's going to happen when you do that to the world. So here's Newton's law. F equals ma, force equals mass times acceleration. So there are things in the world, they've got mass, which is kind of the amount of stuff in them. And acceleration is change in motion. And to get a change in motion of something that has stuff in it, you've got to apply a force. And this equation is great if you want to do something useful, like calculate how much force you've got to apply to a cannonball at a particular elevation of the cannon to get the cannonball to land precisely over there. And that's the kind of thing people want to know, right? Useful stuff. So this equation gave us the Industrial Revolution. This way of thinking about physics in terms of mathematics gave us all those machines that people created from the 17th century onward. Now the problem is, as we all know, next slide, that classical physics gets it wrong. If you use Newton's laws, you get it wrong all over the place. You get it wrong for little bitty things like transistors. You can't begin to understand how transistors work in classical physics. You get it wrong for great big things like stars. Actually, that's a picture of a black hole. You get it wrong for them too. But Classical physics will not tell you why the universe has anything in it but hydrogen. You've got to have quantum theory to understand why there are heavy elements like carbon and iron and stuff like that that's all around us. Quantum th classical physics gets it totally wrong for living systems. So this is a picture of Rhodopsin. If you don't know quantum theory, you can't understand how electron transport in Rhodopsin works. So you can't explain why anybody sees anything. Right? We'd all be blind if we had to use classical physics for our biology. And finally, classical physics even gets it wrong in psychology. This is a couple of graphs from a recent paper by Peter Bruza, where he's trying to understand how people make relevance judgments about documents. Turns out you have to use quantum theory if you actually want to understand how people make relevance judgments about documents. So classical physics is great for cannonballs. But as soon as you get away from cannonballs, it fails utterly. So the question is, why? To answer that question, I think we need to go back to basic, basic things. So next, please. And this is the one equation. I promised you one equation. This is it. So you all learned in elementary school, probably before, that if you want to add stuff up, it doesn't matter how you do it. So if you want to add up the chairs in this room, you can organize them by columns, count the columns, right? Count the number of chairs in each column, and then add the whole mess together. That's why we have multiplication. Or you can do it by rows. Or I can add up those chairs, and these chairs, and those chairs. It doesn't matter how I do it. So I think this is the most important equation in physics. And for all of you who are physicists, you can think of these terms as terms in a Hamiltonian. So I'm going to try to convince you that quantum theory follows from the additivity of the Hamiltonian. But if you're not a physicist, don't worry about that. Just think of these as any arbitrary things at all that you're adding up. So what you learned back in elementary school was it doesn't matter where you put the parentheses when you're doing addition. OK. so. Do a little experiment. I want everyone to look around the room. Okay. 
Now, I bet all of you are seeing lots and lots of parentheses. So, for example, most of you are putting this thing and this thing and this thing in parentheses. And you're saying, that's one entity right here, right? Parentheses. And no one, I bet, no one in here is putting this thing and that camera over there in parentheses and saying, that's one thing. Okay? This says it doesn't matter. Those parentheses make no difference at all. So I want you to look around the room and make all the parentheses disappear. Not very easy, is it? Okay. It's hard to make the parentheses disappear. But that's what physics is about. Physics is about erasing all the parentheses and then putting in parentheses only where we want them <laughs> and nowhere else, <laughs> okay? And then being very willing to erase those parentheses. And the reason classical physics doesn't work, I believe, and I'll try to convince you, is that it slides into our natural belief that some of the parentheses have to be there and that some of the things that we call objects are actually objectively there. <laughs> You've got to pay attention to the equation. Parentheses don't matter at all. So when you're looking around the room and saying, OK, I'm going to make the parentheses disappear, you're doing the next slide. You're saying, I'm the observer, and there's the world. And we're interacting, and there are no parentheses in the world. So that's how we want to think for a little while, and that's going to tell us about entanglement. So there's a very important case that we need to think about if we're going to try to think this way. And that very important case is that when I'm looking at my world out here, I see lots of observers. And when you're looking at your world just outside your eyeballs, you're seeing lots of observers. Next slide. So when you're looking at your world, you see me. And when I'm looking at my world, I see you. But the parentheses don't make any difference to our worlds. So whether you treat me as a thing in your world doesn't make any difference to the world you see. Because the world you see is just your world. And I happen to be in it. But you can draw the parentheses or not. And it doesn't make any difference to your vision of your world. That's the, that's the fundamental thread that we're going to pursue through this talk. Is you can erase the parentheses and it doesn't make any difference. So next slide, please. So actually, the world is full of observers. All of us, we're observers. But because we can erase all the parentheses around us, uh, we're not things at all. And in fact, nothing in the world that we can erase the parentheses around is a thing. So we're just the same as any other kind of thing that you can erase the parentheses around. In other words, next, there's nothing special about observers, at least in physics. Nothing special at all. Observers are just physical systems, which are just parentheses that someone's drawn. OK? Now, you can flip that around and say it the other way. And if you flip it around and say it the other way, it comes out. Everything there is, is an observer. So people ask me, does that mean computers are observers? What about electrons? And I say, yes, they're all observers. <laughs> There's nothing special about observers at all. Nothing, nada. OK, this is why physics is possible. Because if there was something special about observers, or for that matter, if there was something special about this podium, <laughs> then you wouldn't be able to erase the parentheses around this podium. And you wouldn't be able to add things up, regardless of where the parentheses are. And that bit of addition, if math didn't work that way, physics would be impossible. We wouldn't be able to do it. So parentheses being unimportant is why we can do physics at all. And what that tells us is there's nothing special about observers. So next. OK. So we can now rewrite our equation 
just with graphics and say, here's the world full of observers, and I can cut the world up any way I please. So I, I'll cut it up in two, and I'll put some of the observers over there and some over here. But remember, that makes no difference at all to the world. It's just a parenthesis. Okay, next, please. So these things are part of one universe, right? Universe means one. <laughs> all this multiverse stuff is crazy. Forget about that stuff, okay? Universe means one. We're all part of the same universe. And so any parts that we cut it up into are interacting, and our cutting it up into things is just drawing parentheses, and they don't matter at all to anything. Okay, next. So this picture, where I cut the world up, is exactly the same as this picture. Why? Because everything's an observer. So this, even though it's got lots of little observers inside, the whole thing is a big observer. So I can rewrite this picture as that picture, and they're absolutely the same. It doesn't make any difference to the physics whatsoever to draw it this way or this way. And it doesn't make any difference at all to this interaction that I've represented by the double arrows. That's just an interaction going on in the universe that I've created by drawing parentheses and saying, OK, now I've got two things. So all the stuff that the universe is doing, I now have to represent as an interaction between two things. OK, so next. OK, so now we have another equation, but it's in words. Because we can do what we did in the last picture, we can take a cutting up of the universe and replace part of it by an observer. We can infer that observation and physical interaction are exactly the same thing. There's no difference at all between observation and physical interaction. But observation we think of as the transfer of information. And in particular, we think of it as the transfer of classical information. That just means information that one can write down on a finite page. So, or record in binary numbers or something like that that are finite. So if observation and interaction are exactly the same thing, then classical information transfer is exactly the same thing as physical interaction. But if you talk about either interaction or information transfer, what you've done is draw an imaginary boundary, i.e., you've inserted some parentheses in the world somewhere, and you're thinking of the information as being transferred across that imaginary boundary. So we're going to represent that like that. OK. So observation equals interaction. And both of those are just information exchange across an imaginary boundary. And at the panel this morning, there was a bunch of discussion about, is observation and action the same thing? And the answer is interaction goes both ways. <laughs> so if I do something to the world to make an observation, I'm acting on it. And that's what Heisenberg figured out in the 20s. And it led to the whole Heisenberg microscope idea, where if you were looking at an electron, you had to bounce a photon off of it, and the photon perturbed the electron. And that's why we had the uncertainty principle, because you couldn't actually make an observation without perturbing the system you're measuring. Now, of course, that's right. right? All observation is interaction. What Heisenberg didn't do was flip it around and say, all observation is also interaction. Right? Observation is just physical interaction, nothing else. There's nothing special about observation. So there's nothing special about observers. OK, one more. So quantum theory. What is quantum theory? Quantum theory is the minimal, simplest theory that's consistent with an absolute identity between physical interaction and information exchange. And I will happily show anyone who's interested in it how to derive the Schrodinger equation from that. <laughs> but um, I do want to give you one little piece of detail because I've got enough time. So would you go back a few slides, and I'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> 
There. Thanks. Okay. So if interaction and observation are exactly the same thing, let's think very carefully about this diagram and what it says. So you are looking at your world that I happen to be in, but the parentheses you've drawn around me don't make any difference. You could erase those parentheses. What that means is that my interaction with the world, which is defined physically at my boundary, doesn't make any difference to what your interaction is, which is defined at your boundary. Because your interaction, which is this, is defined right at you. It's perfectly local to you. It's defined at the interface between you and your world. And my interface with my world is in here. And that doesn't matter to you because you can erase those parentheses and that boundary goes away. And when the boundary goes away, the interaction is not defined because the interaction is only defined at the boundary. Okay, now what does that tell you? That tells you that whatever I'm doing up here is affecting your world, but your interaction with the world doesn't change because your interaction with your world is defined at your boundary, and what I'm doing up here is defined at my boundary. So my interaction doesn't matter for your interaction. Okay? It matters for your world, but it doesn't matter for your interaction with your world, which is defined only at your boundary. So, right, Einstein here was wrong in thinking that entanglement had something to do with non-locality because the observer's interaction is perfectly local to their boundary with their world, and none of the other parentheses make any difference at all. Okay. So what I've just done is demonstrate to you that what's called the no signaling theorem is true in a very strong form. The no signaling theorem says that two observers who are space-like separated uh, cannot use a shared quantum system as a classical communication channel. Now what I've told you is that we, you and I, cannot use the world that's between us, this blue stuff, as a classical communication channel. Because my interaction is by definition not correlated with your interaction. Your interaction is defined specifically at your boundary, and your interaction is independent completely of whether my interaction with the world is even defined. You can erase me, you can erase the boundary, can't erase the stuff, you can erase the boundary. The interaction is then gone, and your interaction does not change at all. Now what that means is that I'm not communicating information to you. Your world is communicating information to you, because you're interacting only with your world, and the information is flowing from your world to you, and of course, I'm communicating information to my world, but the world is in between us. And there's no classical communication channel between me and you because the world's in the way. And neither of us exerts any control in that world at all. You do not know that I'm standing here. All you know is that you are experiencing a world that is talking to you and doing a bunch of other stuff, like keeping you warm and keeping you in one place and all that. So that's something that skeptical philosophers have been telling us for thousands of years, and of course the Eastern traditions have been telling us for thousands of years. But science starts to take it seriously with quantum theory. So because we have the no signaling theorem, 
we know that a very large fraction of quantum theory follows just from this simple equation I showed you. Because the no signaling theorem is a lot of quantum theory, and it's almost all of special relativity. So as long as you have that simple equation I showed you that says how you add things up doesn't matter, parentheses are not important, you get special relativity for free, okay? Because you have the no signaling theorem. Okay, let's go forward. Uh, that's backward. Oh. Oh boy, no, that goes backwards. Okay, sorry. I don't know left from right either, so it's probably not your fault. Okay, sorry. Okay. So let's go back to this imaginary interface, which is the imaginary boundary that is drawn around you that I could erase, even though you can't, uh, and ask, what is this boundary? Well, it's exactly an interface in Don Hoffman's sense. Don's back in the room. Uh, and he'll be telling you about this stuff tomorrow, and he told you about it last year at this meeting. And he's been working on this for years and years and years. Um, but what it is, is a boundary at which classical information appears because it's a boundary at which classical information is defined. And if I grab this boundary, yank it out of the picture, then this back, big eye ends up back inside this cloud, and there's no dis distinction between them. They just become parentheses. I have to stick the imaginary boundary in to uh, get any classical information at all in this picture. So classical information is just bits that are painted on because they're defined at an imaginary boundary. Now that idea is called holography in high energy physics and cosmology. And it was originally invented to deal with, with information storage by black holes. But it actually applies exactly in this case. Interaction, physical interaction, passes through an imaginary boundary and bits get stored on the boundary. Okay. Now, those bits are what we call the experience of individual objects. Those bits are, for us, parentheses. But for the physics, they're not anything at all. They're just an abstraction, just a little model that our temporal lobes build for us very kindly. So classical information appears at that boundary and it's what defines the interaction between the observer and the observed. But physically, there's no boundary, and physically, there's no interaction. So, as, again, as was said by someone in the panel today, physically, nothing ever happens. <laughs> it's like the talking head's old song about heaven. Right? There's nothing going on until you draw an imaginary boundary, and then lots of stuff is going on because interaction's passing through that boundary. Okay, let's see if I can get this right. So, what is entanglement? Entanglement's just the condition of interacting with the world through an imaginary boundary. So guess what? The old Schrodinger equation with that imaginary number in the beginning was getting something right. It's the boundary that's an imaginary thing. And the interaction's just proceeding through that imaginary boundary and that's why we've got classical information, i.e. measurement. So the measurement problem is nothing. The measurement problem is an artifact of us drawing a boundary in the world and saying, oh, there's classical information there. It must be objectively real. But it's not. OK, so there we are. Thank you very much. Do you want to take questions or do you want me to? Ooh, ooh.
really like this idea of uh, quantum mechanics uh, arising from the interaction across boundaries between the observer and observed. But even in a classical sense, when we draw a boundary around an observer, there is something quite interesting and quite special. When we consider that observer to be a collection of particles, then according to Turing, it cannot form a representation of its own future state. And in fact, it appears that you need to use uh, self-referential mathematics in that instance. And funnily enough, the quantum formalism allows you to create representations of self-referential logical states. So it would appear that drawing a boundary around an observer, even in a classical sense, requires that observer to use self-referential mathematics in order to predict its interaction with the outside world. So maybe you can extend your ideas by considering this, uh, this point. Okay, I, I would love to follow up on that. And if I can just have a couple of minutes, I will. Okay, let's, yeah, this is, this is as good as any, okay? So, remember the no signaling theorem. It says that two observers can't use the shared world as a classical communication channel. So, this observer cannot use cannot communicate classically with one of these observers, okay? And these observers are just physical systems, right? There's nothing special about observers, okay? So what's a clock? A clock is a physical system that we communicate with in order to measure time. So the no signaling theorem says an observer cannot use a clock located in the external world, okay? Because there's no classical communication channel between that clock and the observer. The only clock an observer could possibly have is their entire world, okay? Now, can an observer internally remember what's going on in their world and access that memory? The answer is no, because this is just a physical interaction. So what's happening is this is a physical system that's changing state as a consequence of its interaction with this. And this system can't observe its own past state, because its own past state is in the past, any more than it could observe its own future state. Time is perfectly symmetrical here. So, in fact, an observer has no memory at all. There's no memory in the outside world. There's no memory in the inside world that can be accessed. There's no read access to memory because there's no read access to time. So, when you say self-referential, <laughs> there's typically uh, an assumption that there's a memory there that's privileged, that's a privileged system that can be interacted with apart from the rest of the world. But that assumption's wrong. It just, it just gets us into trouble. So, for example, uh, in characterizing observers, uh, Zurich says an observer is just a physical system that can readily access its memory. Well, there aren't any because there's no such thing, actually, as read access to memory. We're constantly having experiences, some of which seem to us to be memories, but they're just what our world is telling us right then. That's not an answer, I know. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know if this is 
Um, it seems to me that um, s all interactions are not created equal, right? So it seems to me that you have some interactions that produce effects that are different than other interactions. And I'm curious if you see the same thing, and if so, how do you account for that? I know this model's a real simple slice, but how would you account for that interactions seem to produce different results? Well, this, I'm just using the arrows here to represent some interaction or other without saying anything about what kind of interaction it is. So if, you know, if this is a proton, <laughs> then, you know, this is a strong interaction. <laughs> The proton's world is defined by the strong interaction. I'm just saying that whatever the interaction is, it counts as observation. So this is a very strongly panpsychist position. I think you know, whenever you encounter a physicist who's not a panpsychist, say, okay, explain to me in physics terms exactly what the difference is between an observer and anything else. And I've never been able to do it myself, so I think there must not be a difference. So we only have two minutes left, so we have time for a very quick, one more very quick question. Uh, I essentially agree with everything you say in slightly different terminology, but I have one issue with those kind of slides where you have the two arrows coming back, and I'd like a clarification. Are these causally connected in, in a sense that there's an action and a reaction and so on, or is there some other uh, mechanism assumed there? In other, in a, in, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, does the arrow of time go around the cycle between these two, or, or does it interact with time? I don't know how to show it that way. Right. The, the action-reaction story always assumes an objective time. And at, at least in quantum theory, there isn't an objective time. So an interaction is always a, a double-headed arrow affair. So for example, uh, if you look at a, a Feynman diagram, right, and it shows two electrons approaching each other, which is of course a fiction because they're not particles and they're not actually moving, uh, but that's the way it's drawn, and then they exchange a virtual photon. Well, the virtual photon doesn't travel from here over to there, and then another virtual photon travel from here over to the first place. No, it's just uh, an electromagnetic interaction happens, <laughs> and it's instantaneous. So it's not a cause and effect relationship at all. So I probably should have used just big double-headed arrows there to, to be clearer about that. Thank you. So I'll give Chris a warm hand. Thank you very much. Thank you.